Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. It's good to be in the house of the Lord tonight as you all come together. Uh, we're going to have a great time in the word. I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. I need God. So do you. And so come on, stand to your feet and let's go before the Lord together. Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. Father, we haven't come into the house of God to hear from a man or a woman, tall man or short man or old man or young man. We haven't come in here from a white man or black man or brown man. No, Lord, we've come to hear from the teacher of the church who is the Holy Spirit. So welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us. Strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. How good it is to be in the house of the Lord. We're a grateful people that we get to come and praise your name. Grateful that we get to lift our hearts, our hands, our voices. Hear the word of God and apply it in our lives. We can trust you, God. We put our hearts in your hands. And we just thank you, Father, for goodness that you have bestowed upon us and allowed us to be involved in and privileged to see. Thank you, Father, for the great things you're going to do in the hearts of people tonight in this place. Now, Lord, we would ask as you bless us that you would bless all the churches that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless them as you would bless us. Bless our Baptist brothers and Lutherans and Methodists, Episcopalian, Charismatics and Pentecostals, Thank you for Calvary Chapels and Harvest Oak Valley and Oasis, Inland Christian Center, the Assemblies of God, Four Square Denomination, Lord. We thank you for our Catholic brothers and sisters and Adventist, Adventist brothers and sisters, Lord. It's just so good to know that we're free, Father. We're truly free. And we bless them, and we ask you to bless them as you would bless us this night. We'll give you the praise, give you the glory. Jesus' mighty name, with a great big shout, we all say amen. Take your Bible, go with me to Ephesians in the fifth chapter. All I know is this is part number four for the, for the men. Deborah's done a great job on her parts, and I think she has maybe another one left for the ladies, and then we're going to do some things. I don't know, Dan, you didn't mention anything about this, but there is a, like a contest going on, isn't there? Does anybody know anything about that? There's a two-night giveaway, isn't that right, uh, with a hotel... Am I doing pretty good so far? And how does it work so that they can get involved? It's absolutely free. We're paying for everything. For a husband and wife, it's two-night giveaway. You've got to be married. <laughs> so, Dan, help me. Okay, here's, here's the deal. Is here. You should have gotten a little uh, sign-up slip as you walked in. That if you haven't already... Yeah, see, okay, she's, I see one. All right, there's two. Do I hear three? Three, four, four. Do I see five? Five. Okay, so you got that slip as you walked in. If you haven't already filled that out, go ahead and fill that out uh, sometime, and, and they bring it to the prayer boxes. There's two wooden boxes, so if you've already signed up before, just, just one, per, one entry per person. Is that right? One per night. Oh, per Sunday night, so they could do every Sunday night and get more chances to win. Ah, I get it. It makes sense now, Pastor. So anyways, you fill that out, drop it in the prayer box every time the marriage series, and then when the marriage series concludes, we'll draw one, and it's a one night or two night stay? Two night stay at the Industry Hills Pacific Pacific Palms Resort. Which is really shocking. We had our marriage retreat there, and uh, I, you know, you get off the freeway, it's like past West Covina. And you start driving towards the middle of L.A. and you go into yourself, oh, my God, where am I going? I'm going to get killed in another two blocks, you know. And all of a sudden, out of the nowhere in Industry Hills is this oasis on a mountain full of trees and palm trees and hiking trails and golf courses. And it was absolutely gorgeous. The food was phenomenal. And it's two nights. There's no days. You have to go home, don't you, during the day? No, I'm only kidding. (laughs) All right, shut up and let's preach. Okay. In Ephesians, the fifth chapter, the title of the message, if you're making the notes, is Establishing a Position of Growth. And I'll explain what that means as we go along. You'll see 
how the title fits a little bit better. This is uh, part four for the husband. Establishing a position of growth. I, I have a friend of mine here. I told him I was going to use him as an example of Federico Martinez. And Federico Martinez does all the gardening of the church, does the gardening of our house. Federico is not only our gardening of our church, runs a great crew in uh, some of the other churches that we have, but he's also um, uh, just a great friend. Over the years, Federico, wave at everybody. Stand, wave at everybody, if you would. And this is my buddy, Federico. He's a, he's absolutely a, a wonderful, wonderful man of God, and I I love him. He's just got such a great, tender heart. But he's my friend. There's some things that that Federico does that are are cool. He's always trying to please me, and is always doing great things. Right in our living room, it looks out in the front yard, and there's a couple of chairs Debbie and I sit by, and we have coffee in the morning, and we talk, we pray. And um, we uh, discuss the day. We sometimes will sit there for an hour and a half, uh, which is our, usually our only time that we really get that kind of quality time together. And right there in front of outside the window, there's an area that just doesn't grow well at all. There's just, um, it's a dry area. And recently I asked Federico to turn off the water, but he'd never turned it back on since the rain. And everything that he planted about a week and a half ago is now dead. I was looking at it tonight, I and mean, it's just, just dead. But it never does grow, even if it does get water. It doesn't get a lot of sunlight. I don't know if it doesn't get any nourishment. I don't know if it gets the proper temperatures or whatever it is there. In that spot, it's very difficult to get things to grow. <clears throat> In order for it to grow well, any kind of a plant, any kind of activity, a human being has to be in the right atmosphere. And that's what we're talking about tonight. Uh, we can, like for an example, outside the office here, as we park on this side and come in, those of us that are employees here at the church, we park over there, we come in, and there's an area that I don't care. We, you know, we planted trees there 10 years ago. They just haven't grown. There's just something in the soil. There's something on that sub part of the house that doesn't get the right temperature, doesn't get the right water, it doesn't get the right nourishment, doesn't get the right sun, and it just doesn't grow. Where in the other parts of the church grounds, things grow quite well. It's the same thing with life. If we're not going to be in a place where we can grow, properly be fed, properly have growth, then what happens is that we fail. We don't reach our full potential. The, the marriage itself really lags behind and is hindered in many areas and it finds itself wanting on a constant basis. It finds itself never reaching the apex of where it needs to be because it's never been in a place of proper growth. And it is absolutely the same exact thing that you see all the time with people. In fact, if you have children, if you don't feed your children properly and you don't take care of them, if you don't nourish them, you'll find your children will grow up wanting. They'll be less than what they could have been. It's the same thing with our marriages. And I want to read you the verses. And of course, we've talked about a lot of subjects we've probably been at this for a couple of months now, and there have been great subjects, but th as we go through the eight for the men that God gives us, they really are commandments to the men, and four for the wife, men having twice as much responsibility in the family as the wife. It's really interesting. Twice as much responsibility as the wife, and yet at the same time, they both got to flow together in order for it to work properly. It's not based on personalities, it's not based on, on looks, it's not based on anything as to whether or not you're gonna do what God's word says. Bottom line, in order to get nourished, in order to grow properly, in a marriage or in any area of your life, you're gonna to have to be at the right place, doing the right things, doing the right functions, God's way, and that's always God's way. That's the proper way, it's not just you know, Dr. Phil or somebody else's ideologies or philosophies, but it's finding out what God says, who is the creator of marriage. I mean, if you're going to find out how to have a good marriage, you want to find out God's way of having a good marriage and what he says about how marriages work. In fact, you're going to find out that the men, I'm going to say this to you, the men are under amazing attacks worldwide right now 
in homes. And you'll find that to be a fact that the men oftentimes are the failing entity in a great marriage because the men have such responsibility. As goes the man, usually, usually, not always, I'm not going to put an always on that, but as goes the man, usually that's the way the family will go. And if the man is going for God, then you'll find the family going for God. But if the man's not going for God, he's just going for himself or his own philosophies of life, then you'll find that the family's going to be tied up in something that's never going to properly cause them to grow. They'll be unnourished, they'll be dysfunctional, and they'll never be happy. They may stay together, doesn't make a good marriage. Because people stay together because they have a habit of staying together. They don't know where to go, they don't have any money to go anywhere. They've lived together for so long, they might as well just stay a habit. I mean, really, what a horrible... Um, what a horrible future for anybody just to be and stay married and have a habit. When in fact you could have blessing. And it's all simply as to whether or not you're going to insulate and isolate yourself to the things of God uh, and operate within those things. You're going to have to plant the plants in the right place with the right nourishment, getting the right soil conditions and having the right sun. And uh, you're going to have to make sure they have the right nutrients and you're going to make sure they have the right moisture content, not too much, not too little, in order for the plant to properly produce. And it is exactly the same way in everything that we do with God, whether it be your marriage, whether it be your children, whether it be your business, whatever it might possibly be, this book here, the Bible, B-I-B-L-E, not me, but this book tells us how to do life. And if you're going to do life differently than what it says here, then you're going to probably live less than you could have lived. And that's a sad thing to finish your life. Maybe you're so successful with material things, but deep down inside, there isn't the touch of God on the inside, that anointing that breaks the yoke. You know, success is not what you have in your pocket. Success is what carries your heart. And that's what this is really all about. What's carrying your heart? Is it your wallet carrying your heart? Is it your business carrying your heart? Is it your identity? Is your ego carrying your heart? Or is it the very fact that you're touched by God and God knows you and knows your name and you have done something and lived on this planet the way God would have you to live? All of a sudden now the whole doors to heaven open up to you and you start to get blessed. There's so many times I see families that fail because they fail at this one thing and it's called nourishing nourishment and making sure that their proper growth Ephesians 5th chapter verse 21 says it like this submitting one to another in the fear of God boy didn't we talk about that wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord didn't we talk about that for the husband is the head of the wife boy haven't we talked about that as also Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body, verse 24. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so that the wife be to their own husbands and everything. Didn't Deborah talk about that? Husbands, love your wife just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. And all of a sudden he's starting to use this example. And the example is a really cool example. It's easy for us to understand is that husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. Sacrificial love. Love just isn't a funny little thing, roses and huggy and kissy face. That's all part of it. But it's really a different kind of a love. It's a sacrifice. It's giving of yourself for the betterment of someone else when you don't feel like it, even when there's not a response. And that's how Christ did. There was not a response from Christ, but he gave himself for the betterment of someone else. For all of us that are in here, we have got to be challenged with that. So here comes a def this important uh, commandment about loving your wife as Christ loved the church. And I really feel that all the other commandments that are going to follow are going to follow the dictates of that commandment. If you haven't got that part down, everything else is going to be a, a struggle for you. Everything else is not going to work for you. And then you're going to wonder at the end of your life, man, I could have done better, or maybe I should have done better, or maybe we shouldn't have made it, or maybe we should have given up, when in fact you could have had an, an amazing blessing in your life with the choice that God made for you. So it goes on, and it says these words, uh, love your wife as Christ 
loved the church and gave himself, verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot nor wrinkle or any such thing, but that she, speaking of the church, should be holy and without blemish. Wow. In other words, somewhere in there, there's got to be an understanding that if we're going to love the wife as Christ loved the church, we're to take them somewhere. To be holy and without blemish, just like Jesus doing with the church. All of us that are born of the Spirit of God is, is the church. And he makes it very clear that this is an example to us. And he says these words in verse number 28. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. And then he comes along and he describes how that's to be. Watch this. He who loves his wife loves himself. In other words, I'm not separate from my Deborah. When I see her pains, I have pains. When I see her joy, I have joy. When I see her success, I have success. When I see her happy, I'm happy. When I love her, I'm loving me. We're not, we're not separated from each other. We're not two people cohab uh, cohabitating together. We are one in Christ Jesus, which is really a cool illustration. He goes on in verse number 29 and it says, For no one ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourished it and cherished it, just as the Lord has, does the church. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bone. Verse 31, For this reason a man leaves his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself. Notice those words again. And then he comes and says, let the wife see that she respect, or really the word reverence. And Debbie did a great job on that. The word reverence means to see him as a holy man and to treat him with respect as you would a holy person. Reverend. That's where we get the word reverend from. When you see Reverend Joe Schmo and he's got a Reverend R.E.V. in front of him or uh, on his title, it means a reverence. So when he makes a statement, so let the wife respect, it really means reverence. See him as somebody of that importance in your home and in your family. It's like a bizarre statement. It's so contrary to what we see in American homes today. And yet, in order for it to happen, it's not going to be somebody waving a magic wand over your head. You and I are going to have to get in and make this work. It's not easy at times. But it can be done because there's nothing God ever asked you to do that you can't do because God gives you not only the insight on how to do it and gives you the, the, the word of God to follow and gives you the path to follow and has gone before you and says, come on, let's go. You can make it, but he gives you the power of the Holy Ghost. There's only one thing he doesn't do. He doesn't do it for you. You're going to have to get in there in the power of God and make this happen in your life. If you're without the power of God, you'll never make it. This is a spiritual thing that's taking place. And if your marriage is a physical thing and not a spiritual thing, you're going to have to make a change to get over to the spiritual side. And I love this verse, if I may, it tells us how to love your wife as your own body. It comes along, verse number 29. Could I just pop up verse number 29? For no one ever had hated his own flesh, but nourishes it. And that's exactly the same thing that we're talking about when it comes to planting a plant. In fact, the original text here really gives us some insight and its word nourishment means to rear up to maturity or to train or to bring up. Think about the responsibility of this, if you would, just if you could, um, on the overhead. Let's do this. Let me define it once again because they missed that in the back room. Nourishment means to rear up to maturity or to train, or to bring up. Do you guys have that back there? No? Definition? No, you missed it. I'll have to say it again. It means, write it down, to rear up, to maturity. In other words, raise someone up, to train somebody, or to bring them up. That's what nourishment means. Whether you have a home or a uh, you have a dog or a plant or a, uh, uh, kids or whatever it is, you're going to nourish them, bring them up, rear them up. 
to a place of maturity. Now, I don't know if you understand what he just said, but that's the responsibility of the husband. In American churches today, I find that the women are more spiritual than the men, and that's a sad indictment. No wonder we're so messed up in America. When the home is out of order, you'll find that everything starts to get out of order. The kids get out of order, the future gets out of order, the destiny, the purpose is out of order. Everything just may function, but it may function dysfunctionally. Doesn't work right when there's not the order because God is a God of what? He's a God of order. And all of a sudden he makes a statement for him as the head of the house that he is to rear up to maturity or to train to bring up, if you will, that's what this word nourish means. Bring them to a maturity and the responsibility of that is the head of the house is the man, but the man is not as spiritual as the women. And that's a shame. So we've got to turn that around. Wherever you're at tonight, you've got to change that. If you're in here with your spouse, somewhere along the line, just like I'm anointed to be in this pulpit area, you're anointed as a head of that house. You are anointed by God to be there. You could fall off a four-story building and land on your feet because God's behind you. And you got to get off of this that the woman is more uh, a, a, a person of more mature spiritually than you. You need to make some effort to get into the place that God wants you to be and then watch your place place zoom to maturity itself and most men don't want to do that did you know that most men are prompted by their wives to even become Christians prompted by their wife they wouldn't even go to church it wasn't for the wife on them about it and that's a sad indictment and if that's your home, may I say this to you, unless you make some changes and somebody needs to love you enough, tell you the truth, you're going to fail eventually. Or you're going to live your life and be miserable at the end of your life when you could have had, man, I'm talking about one of the greatest relationships you could possibly ever imagine, where every day you are passionately in love and you are soaring with God over the things that God's doing in your life. Or you can live without God and be miserable and just exist and if you want to just exist you might as well just get up right now and get out because I can't do a thing for you and this is for people who want to do it God's way you say pastor that's a little bit rude I have never been anything but rude since when have I ever been anything but rude if you go to this church at all you know I'm somebody I'm not afraid of you I'm not afraid of the results. I'm not afraid of anything. What I'm afraid of is God. So I, listen to me. I don't give a flip what you think about me. I'm afraid of what God thinks about me. And if I don't tell you the truth and try to play games with you, number one, I'm not helping you at all. And number two, I'm not helping myself. Someday I'm going to stand before God. So here's the deal, man. This is a tough indictment against you. And it's time to start becoming the spiritual leader that takes your wife and your entire family and bring them to a place of nourishment. And you start somewhere that's your responsibility, not the pastor's. The pastor in your church should be a support to the family, not the family a support to the church. How to make friends and lose enemies or whatever. <laughs> That's me. I think I got it backwards. <laughs> I want to just share some truths that God gave me. Out of Genesis, will you go with me to the 25th chapter of Genesis? Here in the 25th chapter of Genesis, we, there's a story, if you will, of Joseph. And uh, you remember the story of Joseph. Remember, these are not just stories in Scripture, like Sunday school stories. Every single one of them in the Old Testament are a physical example of the spiritual relationship with God in the New Testament. In other words, this is something taking place. Everything that's mentioned in the Old Testament, listen to what I'm going to say to you. 
Everything that's mentioned in the Old Testament seems like just a story. And you say, why is that story there? Well, stop thinking about it just for a moment. You think God wants us to just memorize stories? We get to heaven, he says, okay, who's the best storyteller? Or who's the best historian? Who knows how this all worked? The stories are there as physical examples of spiritual truths in the New Testament. Do you understand that? In other words, it's a physical example of a truth that's spiritual that you and I live our life by. And everything that's described in the Old Testament, everything in the Old Testament, there's no words. God didn't come along and just burp. Everything that's there is there for a reason. It has meaning. It makes a statement about something. There's this guy named Joseph. And there's so many statements about the life of Joseph that, that uh, ours for us today that are just shocking, life-changing, if you understand them. And that's what we do. We gather together like this. We have a little Bible study, and we, we, we learn. Joseph, if you remember, is sold off to slavery. His brothers ate his guts. They beat him up, throw him down a well, drag him out of a well. Uh, caravan going by on to Egypt, sell him to Egypt. He gets into Egypt, he becomes a slave in the house of Potiphar. Potiphar's wife hustles him because he's a great young man and he says, there's no way I'm going to sin against my, my God. And what he does is he just, if you'll remember, just doesn't do anything but the right thing, but he gets thrown in prison again. And he ends up in this prison for years and years and years and years. Here's this guy that did nothing but hear from God and serve God at a good heart. Kind of like you, you really haven't done anything, but all the junk of life comes at you. And it's a test in your behalf as to whether or not in the midst of this pressure, whether you're gonna keep on going for God. That's what Jesus, excuse me, that's what Joseph did. In the midst of the pressure, he keeps on going for God. In the midst of the pressure that your life will have, including your marriage, are you going to go back to God or are you going to complain and stay in a prison? Because it's only when you finally realize that the prison is okay because you got God, that God gets you out of the prison, takes him, remember this, from the prison to the palace all in one day. I mean, who goes from the prison of an Egyptian prison thousands of years ago into the palace all in one day? Becomes the prime minister, second in charge only to Pharaoh himself of all the wealth of Egypt, all, listen to me, is this crazy? All in one day, don't tell me God can't turn around your lifestyle and turn around your circumstances all in one day. And God takes him from the prison to the palace all in one day. There is hope for every one of us that God can do this. But we're going to have to be like Joseph. Joseph finally has his brothers many, many years later that comes back and even brings the father, comes back to Joseph. And they come in because there's a famine in the land. Remember I told you the story, the word famine means that there's a shortage of food. There, it was an agricultural society. If it didn't rain and there was you know, drought in the land, there was no food. People starved to death. Animals died. People died of no water. It was a very difficult time. It's not like us. We turn on a sprinkler. You know, we go to the store and we're mad if they don't have our product in. Everything is in the store. And every one of the cash registers on the way out says the same thing to me as they say to you. Did you find everything you wanted? In those days, they never had anything like that. If it didn't rain, man, they died. And there was this famine. It's called the famine. And there's a famine in the land. And Joseph tells the Pharaoh, the Egyptian king, what to do. And he makes him very, very rich. Well, his brothers are starving in the land, Canaan land. So they come to find out if they can buy food from this new head of Egypt who's distributing food. They don't know it's his brother. And all of a sudden, but Joseph recognizes his brothers. Of course, he's all decked out in this Egyptian thing, and they're just stunned. They're, they come and they bow before him, and they're begging him. And, and he says, Stand. He puts him through a rig and a roll. And then he breaks down. And he starts to cry. And he says, I'm Joseph, your brother. They couldn't believe it, man. Shock city. And they just didn't know what to do. And the interesting thing that takes place is there's a word that is used, that Joseph speaks to his family. In Genesis, the 25th chapter, verse number 11 says, there I, and this is the, if I can use this, this is the New King James. 
Other translations translate it better. There I will provide for you. Least you in your household and all that you have come to poverty for there still be five years of famine. In other words, there's five more years, but I'll take care of you. I will provide for you. See the words that I've highlighted up there, the words provide for you. The word in the original Hebrew is the word for nourish. I will nourish you. And when it comes to a relationship with God, God's always looking for someone to nourish someone else. Jesus came and he nourished us. He sends the Holy Spirit that nourishes us. He sends his disciples out to preach the gospel and the word of God is written and prophecy comes all to nourish, if you will, to bring us up, to train us, to bring us to a place of maturity. And he says to his family, he says, don't worry about the famine in the land. I'm here and I will bring you up. In other words, listen to this. I will nourish your family for the next five years of this family. And that's what God's looking for with the husband. Somebody who will provide a place that is healthy, strong, and a place that the family can get the right nutrients, get the right activity, have the right, if, if, you're, if, it's, you know, if, it's a, if it was a plant, we'd say it like this, gets the right place, the family can grow spiritually. And that's the husband's act. The provision usually stops with, I went to work, I got money to pay the bills. And that is the shallowest expression of provision for a family. And yet most men in America, even in American churches, think that's all they have to do is go to work, put their pants on, go to work, get a paycheck, come home. And that's not what it is. That's the shallowest expression of nutrition of nourishment for the family. And that's what we're, we're not just looking at that and stopping there. And that's what happened in America is that men came along, they were so unspiritual, this is not you, but men were so unspiritual, all they could do is think about providing money instead of providing all the other things that are needed for the proper growth. Because guess what? I can have the right soil, but the plant die because it doesn't have the sun. I can have the right sun, but it doesn't get the right nutrition, doesn't have the right uh, uh, water. I can get the uh, right sun, but I can still miss the very fact that uh, I have absolutely uh, too much shade or too much. I can, it, it, just, it has to be just right for, the, for it to grow. And so for a man to go to work and bring his paycheck home and say, and I provide for you, is absolutely ridiculous. That's what you should be doing. Now we're talking about over and above the provision of just your paycheck. Because in order for your family to go on, it's going to have to go on the things of God. Is anybody listening? So God gave me four things that are important for us to see. I want to share with you men and women, really, because it's good for all of us, on how to nourish scripturally. Nourishment, listen to this, how to nourish. Number one, starts in the home. It does not start just out there somewhere. It does not start in your job. It does not start with a car. It does not start with bringing home clothes. It does not start with things like that. It starts literally in the home. And that's where nourishment must take its place, is in the home, in order for there to be maturity in the home. I love what the Word of God says about, if you will, Moses in Acts the seventh chapter. Listen to this. In Acts the seventh chapter, again, he's going to quote something that takes place in Moses, if you'll remember, from the Old Testament. But in Acts the seventh chapter, verse number 20, just pop it up for me. It says, at this time Moses was born. Remember when Moses was born? Of course you do. You saw the movie. <laughs> and when Moses was born, listen to this and was well pleasing to God. In other words, God wasn't shocked. God was, God was excited about Moses being born. Watch this. And he was brought up, see the word brought up in the original text means nourished. 
And listen to the words. It's not, he could have said anything, but he used the word nourished here. In his father's house for three months before he was let go and taken into Pharaoh's house. In other words, he was nourished in the house. God is making a statement that this has got to start in the house. Can I just say something to you? Listen, again, I want to make this statement to you, which is a shocking statement. The church is here to support the house. The house should not just be here to support the church. In other words, we ought to be a complement to what you do spiritually with your children in your, in your home. May I say this? 70% of a child's education comes not from a school teacher, but from the house. Did you hear what I just said? Statistics show that 70% of a child's education doesn't come from a school teacher, it comes from his house. And if the house is out of order and screwed up, can I just say something to you? There's no way in the world you're ever gonna get back on track until you make a decision to rightfully follow the ways of the Lord. Is anybody listening? So he says in his very, he's making a statement that even Moses in his young age started somewhere in this, where he started was in his own house. What do I mean by that? Well, oftentimes you're gonna to have to gather your families together and have family nights. We used to do this. Do you know one of the greatest programs that we ever did at the Rock Church World Outreach Center is a program that failed. Let me say it again to you. Did you know one of the greatest programs that we ever had at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center is a program that failed? Do you know what we used to do before we moved into this building, years before we moved into this building? We used to, in fact, it was like eight years before we moved into this building, maybe 20 years ago. Debbie and I would write a curriculum and they would print it up and the parents would come in and get a curriculum every single week based on what I preached. And it had even cartoon characters in there. And they would sit down with the family and they would have family night once every single week with their families where the parents would develop a relationship spiritually with each other in front of their children so they could have healthy families. You say, well, why did that fail? Because nobody wanted to pick up the material. We were printing material and nobody would pick it up. The whole church was there and they didn't want it. Isn't that sad? I mean, how perfect is it? We'd even supply communion cups where they'd have those little cups, you know, with the wafers on that we use. They could take them home and they could sit once in a while with their family and have communion just like at church. And then when they came to church, they'd say, wow, the church is doing what our family is doing. Some of them got so tied up, they said, we don't need the church. The church keeps you healthy so you keep on doing what you're doing because the world is attacking on a constant basis and you need the church because God designed the church. And yet they get so, it was such a mess. The best thing we ever did is something that failed because in order to start at the home, you're gonna to have to have family nights. Family nights means you gather, you turn the stupid television off and you shut down the cell phones and you put them aside and you shut down Facebook and you shut down your Twitter tweets. And you put it aside and you and your kids talk and you pray together and you have a communion time and you talk about the word of God and you talk about the husband's role. And men, instead of trying to be so spiritual for your kids, be honest before your kids. I used to swear a lot. And then my son who was four years old would correct me. I'd say, shut up, Luke. You're four years old. He'd say, dad, but pastors don't talk that way. I'd say, how do you know you're only four? The other day, he swore in his little, how old is Bjorn? Two. He said, Daddy, that's not a good word. And he got corrected by his uh, kid. <laughs> Stop trying to be a phony. We're all in this together. 
And you know what? When you're honest and upfront and you're open as a book, you know, the wife starts to respect the husband. She knows he's not some great spiritual leader. But man, give the guy some time. He started somewhere. Even if he's reading John 3, 16, and that's all he knows. Listen, you don't have to do truth in order to talk truth. You talk truth before you start doing truth. We've got it all backwards. I can't talk this unless I'm doing it because if I talk it and I'm not doing it, I'm a hypocrite. Can I tell you something? You're a hypocrite if you don't start talking it first and then realize that's what causes you to do it. It's not about talking it first, uh, I mean doing it and then talking it. If I only talked to you about what truth had to say, I would only be on John 3, 16 with you. I'm in this with you. I'm just like you. I'm learning as we go like everybody else. Stop trying to be a phony. And when the wife sees that you're honest and the kid sees that you're honest and you're really trying to make gain going forward, they'll respect you, love you, and grow up to serve the Lord because they know God's perfect and dad wasn't, but God was. And it starts at the home. Start somewhere. I like this. Number two, we're talking about how to nourish. I'm so sorry I'm going so long. I just think it's important. If we're coming here tonight, let's get something. Is that okay? Yeah. Number two, use the word of God. If you're going to nourish, listen, you can use anything you want to do, but I can put stuff in the soil for a plant that'll kill the plant. Is that not true? I mean, I'm going to plant a, a plant. I'm going to put glass all around the plant. That's not going to help the plant one bit. But if I take the plant, put it in the ground, and I put fertilizer around it, and I water it, it's the right nutrients. In other words, there's going to be something in your life that's going to be right. And you know what that is? It's the Word of God. It's always the Word of God. You may not know anything about the Word of God. Start somewhere. Read the commentaries. Read it out loud. Talk about it with your children. Pray about it. You can start out with a five-minute in-home Bible study, and your wife will respect you. And can I just say this to you? Listen, women. Uh, so many of you are so ticked off at your husband because they made lousy choices. They were, have been lousy husbands. They made uh, bad decisions. They violated your relationship. And now you're mad as a, a bag of snakes at them and you want to get revenge. And all of a sudden, the guy starts to work a little bit towards God and you're like all pissy at him. And you're going to have to get over being pissy at him and realize the guy started in the beginning and he's got five minutes of something he's talking about. It may not be very cool yet, but someday it will be cool. And you help and you support him. Is anybody listening? We'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. But you've got to start with the Word of God in 1 Timothy, the fourth chapter. 1 Timothy, the fourth chapter, I'll just put it up in the overhead. Verse number six says it like this. Listen to this. Now, listen, when we're talking about instructing, we're talking about lifting, we're talking about building. It starts in the house. You've got to use the word of God. That's the fertilizer for growth. It always has been. When we gather together, it isn't just singing a song. If we came into the house of God and we did nothing but sing songs, did you know you would never spiritually grow? Did you know that when you come into the house, you've got to listen to this, and all we did was talk about Jesus. Boy, Jesus is wonderful. Don't misunderstand me. Don't get all mad at me right now. Listen to what I'm going to say. Jesus is wonderful. But if all we did was talk about Jesus' attributes and never talk about his attributes being related to you and how you could operate, then you would never grow either. You've got to have everything in place. The very thing that brings a nutrient, that brings up a family and a wife, is the husband, is the head of the house, who's going to bring this activity. It isn't the wife saying, remember you promised every Tuesday we were going to gather. I'm too tired this week. You shut up, dude. Get in there and pretend like you're not too tired and do what God would have you to do about it. Is anybody listening? And so here we find that the word of God is so important. And it says, if you instruct the brother in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ. We're talking about husbands now. Of course, this is talking about the ministry of the church, same thing. And he says this, nourish in the words of faith. If you didn't know anything 
yes, oh, you said before your wife, you sat before your kids and you said these words. Man, now listen, we can make it because God said we can make it. All things are possible to him that believes. Nothing's impossible to him that believes. God's a great God sitting on the throne. You said nothing but that to them. Guess what? Those words of faith will go into the heart of the wife and all of a sudden she'll see that her husband is starting to turn around doing the right thing. You've got to be the minister that God's called you to be in order to have the marriage that you need to have in order to live successful in your life. Somebody ought to give me a great big amen. Nourishing the words of faith and good teaching. See the word doctrine up there means teaching which you will have carefully followed. In other words, do the very best you can. Carefully follow this good teaching. Where do you get that? You get it at church. Make sure that you don't get crazy. You come and you balance yourself out by hearing the word of God at a good church that teaches the word. So we can do anything. We could sing songs forever. We can get together and have a Holy Spirit speaking in tongues, jumping up and down, roll down the aisles. We made the aisles right here so you can roll down real easy. No, we didn't. I'll smack you right in the head you roll down my aisle. Throw you out of this place, which I am real good at. To keep you healthy. Because there's some people that want to roll down the aisles. And let me tell you something. What do we do every time we gather together? The Word of God. The Word of God. The Word of God. There's a lot of churches built on prophecy. Built on spiritual uh, this. And uh, the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Or built on music. Built on worship. Built on dancing. Built on praise. This church built on the Word of God. Because it's the Word of God that is the fertilizer for the growth of not only you, but as your family together. And men, you can do this. There is no doubt that Debbie is more spiritual than me, but I'm still the head of the house and I'm still a spiritual leader of my house. I got up this morning, walked downstairs, heard somebody huffing and puffing. I thought, man, I, I know what she's doing. She's praying. Went and got a cup of coffee. I mean, my eyes are not even open yet. The woman's in there just beating heaven and earth together. She says, you want to join me? I said, nope. I'm having coffee. But I'll sit here. You just go for it, girl. She said, well, I'm going to do this for about another half an hour. I said, okay, I'm not going to bother you. Just go ahead. There's no doubt she's more spiritual than me. But I want you to know something. I'm still a man of God. That doesn't make me any less of a man of God because she's more spiritual. So stop trying to be more spiritual than the woman. Just be a man of God and watch God fit you both together properly. Come on, somebody. No doubt about it. Number three, we're talking about how to nourish. Number one, starts in the home. Number two, use the word of God. Number three, in how to nourish in togetherness. You are not alone in this. There's got to be togetherness. What do I mean by togetherness? What do I mean by uh, uh, realizing that, that people are together and, and, and there's oneness in this? There's a story of David and Bathsheba has a husband named Uriah. You remember it, if you will, in 2 Samuel. You might as well turn there and let me explain to you. The Bible makes it very clear that if we're not in agreement about something, it won't work. And so here we find this story taking place where David is checking out Bathsheba, doing something he shouldn't have done. The Bible made it very clear that David should have been at war, but he stayed behind and he didn't fight the battle. While he was staying behind instead of at war, guess what happens? Here's Bathsheba on a rooftop a little bit lower than the palace. And she's, isn't it convenient, bathing outside. Well, you can say anything you want to say, but I believe she's not a stupid woman and knew that window up there was David's and knew David was there because she's naked in front of David. And David is just this stupid man. Of course, it's so spiritual, but he's looking. He's checking her out. And then he not only checks her out, man, he checks her out all the way, has sex with her and has impregnated her. You say, David, King David, the greatest king Israel has ever known? David, from his bloodline comes Jesus? Yes. 
Can you imagine such a thing? And here we find the very important truth. He now calls her husband, who happens to be on the battle line. Bring him home. Let him sleep with his wife, and everybody will think that baby is his. But he, Uriah, has too much integrity. And he says, while my men are on the field fighting, I'm not going to be sleeping with my wife. And he sleeps at the doorstep and never goes into his wife. And everybody knows it. Now David's in trouble. So he sends Uriah, the husband, back to the battle lines and tells everybody, put him out in front and everybody back off. Leave him out there by himself. And he gets killed out there. David murdered the man. In the bloodline of Jesus is a murderer by the name of David. Come on, somebody. You say, how could God ever use someone like that? It's the same way God can use you. And God can use me. He's not looking for perfect people. He's looking for people who know they have a perfect God. And that's what this is all about. And we find that David, years later... A man comes to David and he makes a statement and he starts to talk to David in 2 Samuel, the 12th chapter. If you got your Bibles, go there with me. In 2 Samuel, the 12th chapter. And here we find this prophet of God comes to David. And he starts to tell, his name is Nahum to David, and he starts to talk to David about a story about a man who had a, something special. And in verse number three, he says this word, but the poor man, he uses him as an example, and he said, had nothing except one little hue, a lamb which had been brought and nourished It grew up together with him and with his children. And he says this little lamb was so important. The lamb was like a, if you will, a daughter to the man. And when a rich man came, he didn't want to eat from the flock. He wanted to eat that little lamb. And he came and he ate that lamb. It was his most important, valuable commodity. And David's mad as he can possibly be. He says, who is this guy that has done that? And the prophet looks at David and says, David, it's you. You took that other man's wife. It was all he had. You took his wife. And you need to repent before God. And David repents and never does anything like that again. But the point being is what's being said here. He brings the little lamb into the house. We're talking about it's in the house. We're talking about it's being in the word of God that is nourishment. And he says as he brings this lamb in and nourished it and he grew up together with him and his family. In other words, they were together. And guys, you're going to have to have a relationship that's together on this. You can't have a wife that's in one direction and a husband in another direction. If anything, the thing that caused that lamb to grow so well is the fact that they were brought in and they were together. I love those words. Nourished and it grew up together with him and his children. And you and I have got to come to a place of realizing this is not a husband against the wife or the wife against the husband. This is not you do your thing and I'll do my thing and I, I love you but I don't want any part of you and I, I, I really don't like this and I, I hate the way we live and I hate our lifestyle. You're going to have to get together about something. And can I tell you something, wives? I know you've been hurt. I know you've been disappointed. I know you've been discouraged. I even know that some of you today as I speak to you, your covenant has been broken in marriage. But yet I'm speaking to you now by the Spirit. You're going to have to give in and you're going to have to realize that you have to follow that man and all you have to do is give that man a little bit of time, give him a little bit of effort, give him a little bit of encouragement to be the spiritual leader because when there is togetherness, there is growth. And nourishment comes when there's togetherness. And you'll find if you take someone out of the flock and you take a sheep out of the flock, put it by itself, it will not grow as well as being in the flock. In fact, when they're by themselves, they die. 
But when they're together with something they can relate with. And that's why it's important for husbands and wives to be together. It's in the togetherness that the crew and was with the children. That was a very special. That's not just a story. It's a truth for all of us to understand. Fourth thing, we're talking about how to nourish. Number one, starts in the home. Number two, use the word number three, is this, this togetherness. Number three, number four, is we've got to have mutual understanding. You can't understand one thing one way and someone else understands something else that way. If there's anything I can say about our life, is that Debbie and I had mutual agreement about what we were doing. There's even things theologically that we don't agree upon so much, but it's never been a big deal. It's been a little nothing, if you want to know the truth. But we've always had a mutual understanding. There's a difference between togetherness, being together with someone you love, and there's a difference between being together and understanding the same thing. Understanding the plan, understanding the direction, understanding what this is really all about, understanding the Word of God, understanding the expressions of the Lord, understanding how life works. Without understanding between two people, there'll never be the nourishment that you need in order to grow. There'll always be a division, which means it's like a plant without the sun, or a plant without the water, or a plant without the nutrients. You'll find yourself away from it. But when there is understanding where everything is working together to do its part, then there's a marriage that is nourished and a marriage that grows. It's so important for us to see Isaiah, the first chapter. It's popping up on the over. It started verse number two. God talks about Israel. And how they were just out of understanding. It says, hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. Can I just say something? When God makes a statement like that, we ought to do some things. One, we ought to hear. and We ought to give ear. Because he's not only talking to the earth and people upon the earth. He's talking to all of heaven. And he says, hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. For the Lord has spoken. And now listen to what he says. I have nourished and brought up children. And they have rebelled against it. There is no understanding. Today in American churches, there is no understanding of the purpose why you even go to church. You, most people go to church because they think they're doing their penance before the Lord. Most people go to church because they think, well, God will give them a brownie point because they went to church. Can I just tell you something? None of that is a reason to go to church. None of that was a purpose of why a church should be established. It was never met there so we could run through routines and ceremonial rituals. There's a real purpose for a church. And most people that attend American churches they have no idea what the real purpose is. Even pastors that are in these churches, I know them. They don't don't even know why they're even pastoring. Yeah. And he makes this statement, I have nourished and brought up children and they have rebelled against me. And you know why? Because there's no understanding of what this is all about. In verse number three, the oxen knows the owner, the donkey its master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not consider in other words, here it is, without understanding about what you are doing, there's no common ground for you to do it. And there's no common ground for you to stay in it. And you've got to come to a place of understanding in order to grow. When a husband says to the wife, we're going to serve God, we're going to do it God's way. What God says goes. It may not make sense to us, but what God says, and I don't even know what that is, you may say to your wife, but guess what? We're going to learn what God's way are. Or we're going to consider his way. Guess what happened? You will never be in a state of rebellion if you find yourself with common understanding. But if you leave yourself without understanding, you will always rebel against the things of God. Somebody ought to say amen. And it's so true. All of us in here, when you see that little word, nourish, if you will, go back with me in Ephesians, the fifth chapter. And it's a brilliant little word. And verse number 29, 
For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes. It's not just a word. It's a lifestyle. And that's what we all miss. Because we don't consider and we don't understand what this is really all about. If you don't know, hang on for God's sakes. Be wise. Stop running. Start spending some time listening where you can find out what the heck this is all about and what the Bible says. Because without it, we will never nourish to the place of growth. We will just live out of habits. And God has a whole lot more than a habit for you for the rest of your life. Somebody ought to give the Lord a great big praise. Sorry I get so emotional, but I believe this. That's why I'm passionate about it. I mean, I'm so passionate about it, you know, I just don't know how to express it any other way. I mean, I just couldn't do it. I don't know how to express it. Thanks for letting me express it my way. You know, I can't be what other people are. I have to be what I am. I'm very passionate towards the health and condition of the church, which is only based on the health and the condition of the family. That's what this is all about. When the family falls apart, then what you have is you have a lot of dysfunctional people in a church that are rebellious against the understanding that God has for them. And then you have chaos in a church. And man, as a senior pastor of a church, we're doing everything we can to hold it together, hold everything together. I mean, you can't believe how dysfunctional even the rock is. These people can't sit through one hour's worth of teaching without getting up, walking out vandalizing our bathrooms and stealing everything they can. And yet they come to church. I mean, it's a mess. Now, I don't have a problem with that because they're on the growth thing. We understand that's the process of growth. But man, just like your family, you're going to fight for your family. I'm fighting for the church. So a lot of people don't understand. This is not just something that happens. It's, it happens because we fight for it. Your marriage happens because you fight for it. Debbie and I fight, and then we fight to keep together. And that's the way it's been for 35 years. We fight, she wins, and then we fight to keep it together. Sorry I got so serious with you tonight. If God spoke to you, come on, give the Lord a great big praise. What a responsibility the men have. Now, women, if you don't have a man, Jesus is your husband. You still have a responsibility for your children to do exactly the same thing. Do what you're supposed to do. Prepare your heart and God will bring you a man. If that's what you want. You say, oh, come on. Oh, yeah. Watch God. He can do anything. Tonight, I want to make sure everybody's right with God before we leave. Even before we receive tithes and offerings. And man, do we need to receive tithes and offerings. We're so far behind these last four months. It's been horrible. I know. I don't want to put any pressure on you, but that's the way it is. But I want to make sure everybody that needs to get right with God will get right with God tonight. The only way you can get right with God is to give God all of your heart and all of your life. You know, bottom line, let's be honest. You don't get to heaven because you're nice. And God's not going to look at how much you accomplished, what you attained, how famous or unfamous you are, how gifted you are. That's never been prerequisite for heaven. This is not about what you have in your wallet or how many degrees you have on your walls. Never been there. It's all about your heart that gets you to heaven. You say, well, I have a good heart. I guess I'll make it. But there's none good but God unless your heart is after God. 
Your good is not God's good, and that's the difference. And what you call good is not what God calls good. That's the shock. A little shock when people find that out. I could say, well, I'm really good on whose standards? Who? By who declares that? Our society, our social system determines how we get to heaven? Jesus comes along to a really good guy, better than all of us in John 3rd chapter. His name is Nicodemus. I mean, if you stop and think about Nicodemus, he was probably better in his lifestyle than every one of us that are in this room right now. The guy fed the poor. He wore ecclesiastical robes. Memorized scripture. Debated the word of God. Studied the word of God. Taught the word of God. Sang the word of God. How many of you sing the word of God? This guy fed the poor in his community, took care of people. He was the head of his church. It was called the synagogue. I would have thought for sure that Jesus would have come to this guy. Nicodemus said, hey, Nicodemus, man, hey, listen, listen, listen. You're such a good guy. You need to come into heaven. You're going to love heaven. Heaven's waiting for you. You're going to love it, man. He does it. He says to Nicodemus these words, John 3rd chapter, you must be born again. You're going to have to give God all of your heart and all of your life because that's what born again means. Did you know that most people attend American churches in America don't know what born again means? When they hear the words born again, they freak out and say, born again are a bunch of weirdo, freaky guys on television and movies. Hollywood's done a good job to portray born again people as idiots. But that's not what this is about. Born again means this from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, because you must be born again to get to heaven. So here's what it means. It means you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Always has been, always will be. Yeah, you may be good, that's fine. You may be a nice person. You may even quote scripture. You probably don't have a problem with Jesus. You know who he is because you celebrate Christmas and Easter every year of your life. You have great head knowledge about who Jesus is. But guess what? So does the devil and he's not going to heaven. So it's not about what you have in your head. It's all about look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. It's all about what you do with your heart. Have you given God all of your heart? Have you given God all of your life? You notice how I said give? Because he's not a thief to rob it from you. It's your heart and life. He's not a conniver to talk you out of it. It's your heart and life. He's not a manipulator. He doesn't float around some cosmic cloud hitch with a two by four until you finally give in to him and give him all of your heart and life. He doesn't do that. Could he do it? You bet. But then he's manipulating you to do it. And it's not about you doing it. It's about your heart that wants to do it. And that's where we've missed it in American churches. You've got to give God all of your heart. You've got to give God all of your life. And here we are in this safe, friendly place today. I want to make sure that you've given God all of your heart and all of your life. If you're in this place today and you haven't yet given him all of your heart and all of your life, why don't you let us pray with you? We won't weird you out. We won't freak you out. We won't scare you. We won't make you feel uncomfortable. But I'm just going to ask you, if you want us to pray for you, to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and give God all of your heart and all of your life, guess what? We want to do it. You need to do it. And you need to, in a moment, I'll count to three. You need to get your hand up. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll go bang when you hear that sound. Bang! Your hand goes up all across this auditorium, back in the family room. Listen, men, I'm talking to you right now. It's time for you to make the step forward for Jesus and stop messing around with God. And if you're going to ever be the head of your house and if you're ever going to be the one who's going to nourish your wife and nourish your children and nourish your family, you're going to have to give God all of your heart and stop, stop screwing around. And today is the first step. And we won't put you down for it. We'll respect you for it. But you're going to have to make the statement. What statement? Raising your hand, saying, I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. And I want to give God all my heart, give God all my life. 
You've been running from God instead of to God, get ready to put your hand up. If you've never given him all of your heart, get ready to put your hand up. If you've never given him all of your life, get ready to put your hand up. You're one of those people that are not sure, make sure. If you're uncomfortable right now, I'm talking to you and you know it. There's only one way to get out of that. And that's to get comfortable by giving God all of your heart and all of your life. Your call, your choice. I've done my job. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. You get your hand up. Men and women together. All across this auditorium, back to the family rooms that are full. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. You get your hand up. Let me see it. Put it right back down. Are you ready? Here it is. One, two, let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four. Thank you. Five, six, seven, eight. Thank you. Back over here. Anybody else? Anybody else on this side? There's eight wise people. There's nine right here. God bless you. Anybody else? I think I saw you, but ten right back there. God bless you. Anybody else? There's ten wise people. Anybody else? Anybody else? There's another one. Where, where Mike? Right back in here somewhere. 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 I don't know. Wave at me if that's your hand. Uh, if, you're, if your hand is raised. All right, well, praise God. There's another one back in the family room. Levin, God bless you. Let's give the Lord a great big praise for 11 wise people. Now look, here's what I want to do. I want all 11 of you that raise your hand and get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend, get your stuff. I want you to come up quickly. And I don't want anybody to leave because you know why? We need to receive tithes and offerings. We've got to pay the bills of this place, all of us together. We'll all do our part. It works. If we don't, it doesn't work. So come on, give God a break. Give this church, which you call your church, a break too. And let's, let's stay put just for a minute longer while these people, all 11 of you, 12 of you or 13, didn't raise your hand, but you should have. I want you to get out of your seat, get in the aisle, meet me right here in front. You come right now. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, get out of your seat and come. Come out of the family room. Come on, ushers, help them out of the family room. Jesus, you're my everything. Surrender. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. You're my everything. You're my everything. You're my everything. I surrender to you. Come on, if you raise your hand, you're serious about God. You come right now. Come on. You're my everything. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. God, good. Well, thank God you guys have come. We're just happy about that. Are you guys coming? Come on, you just come on forward. You come on with them, Dad. This is a good thing. This is a good thing. All right, cool. Come on. Okay, all of you up front. This is Joel, Pastor Joel. Pastor's a good guy. He's going to pray with you. Only takes a few moments. Make a left turn. Follow him right over there. He'll pray with you. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again, I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. 
Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.